So my name is Liz Tanner. I am the Secretary of Commerce for the state of Rhode Island. And I, I have with me Jim Mason, who was our consultant on our project that we did in Rhode Island. And uh, we're really excited to not just show you what our project was, um, but it's been fascinating to me to be in all the sessions today that are very much focused on, well, if we could only get the government to do more. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the insight of why we don't do more, um, but also to give you some pointers on uh, what, what would be helpful to us when, when people are trying to sell things to us or at least present solutions. So, um, so I have a wide background. I am not a tech person at all. I understand about a third of what's happening today. Um, but I like to fix things. I like to make things better. I'm a problem solver. And for me, I was hired uh, by then Governor Gina Raimondo, who is now the Commerce Secretary under President Biden in America, uh, to make it easier to do business. And so as an attorney who had opened up several hundred businesses, I came to government trying to figure out what do other states do? And I very quickly realized that nobody in America is really doing a very good job at this, and so I started looking internationally. And so there's a lot going on internationally that I have very much tried to model um, in, in an American way to, to bring things. And Jim, if you want to flip to the next slide. Sure. We don't have a lot of time, so we'll talk about it all later. Um, he's the tech guy. So he's who, he is who we've hired to do our project. Um, our project has ended, and he's now very busy doing Lots of other things. Jim, you want to just give a quick highlight of your resume? Yeah, so my background, I'm a DLT architect today at DTCC, working on what I call refinance, where we're reimagining how finance works in the, I'll call it, new technology era. And I, of course, I'm part of Hyperledger, Hyperledger project, uh, public sector group leader in that, and work on a bunch of other things. I have a long history that I don't care about, and you shouldn't either. So <laughs> we're done with Not that. Not between now and the Guinness. So, so how do we get here? So like I said, I, it was my job to try to make it easier to do business. We discovered the European models and said, oh, somebody is actually doing this better. Um, I have been very much focused on the Estonian model. That has been my, um, my guide that I have looked at. I'm actually going next month to get a one-on-one -on -one session with them. I'm very excited about it. Um, but what we finally did was to say, OK, what do we want to do? So we put out a, a RFP, a request for proposals, to do a proof of concept to introduce blockchain technology to government. And this was back in 2018, 19. Uh, we received over 60 ideas from over 30 companies, unprecedented number of responses um, for, for our state. And we vetted it down, essentially, to one company. And we worked with Infosys, who worked with us on um, what ultimately ended up being a credentialing project. So what I'd like to try to show you is, is what that project looked like. But as far as many governments who have asked me, where do you start, where do you begin, the, person, the answer is the person who has the most enthusiasm for it, because you're not going to get anybody to do it if they don't want to do it. Um, it's been very hard for me to get my colleagues on board with it, uh, but it's something that I had been very interested in, because I'd seen the European models and how things could work. And so I had to do what was under my purview. And at the time, I was the director of the Department of Business Regulation, and I regulate a wide variety of license types. <clears throat> OK. So what we did here was our traditional identity was to start with Emily, who has to submit documents to prove her identity at the Department of Motor Vehicles for her driver's license. She then sort of registers herself to apply for the license, has to show her proof of identification, makes her way down to uh, filling out all sorts of other pieces of paperwork to prove that she can be an accountant. That's what we chose to do, and ultimately does get her license. But by creating the self-sovereign identity model, yeah. it's a far more streamlined approach. One of the questions I get is, why did you choose accountants? So in the United States, accountants, while they are um, a license in every state, for the most part, when you're good in one state, you're good in all 50 states. And so when you do taxes in other states, you constantly have to prove your credential. And so it was really important for them to be able to have a way to show their credential. So we are actually working with the national association that oversees uh, CPA credentials called NASBA. And they're very interested because what they would love to do is use this as a model in all 50 states so that all CPAs can now use this um, as a credential. I will also say from a what, how can you start this project? Why did we choose CPA credentials? Because that's just about as boring as it can get. We didn't want to do anything. To, that's right. We do <laughs> love CPAs. I'm a lawyer, right? So I'm here with you. Um, but we purposely chose something that was really boring because we wanted to show success. You know, one of the things that's going on in the world right now is governments can't fail. They constantly are being kind of dinged for uh, doing something wrong and wasting taxpayer dollars. So we started something very safe, very secure, very simple, because we wanted to be able to prove it and make sure that people um, could start to get on board with it. Because anytime we use the word blockchain, which I almost never use anymore, people got nervous. You know, when you say blockchain in government, 
All they know about is the guy who lost a million dollars because they lost his password. That's all that I hear over and over and over again. So we purposely said, all right, we're going to try to talk about digital government. So that's the way we frame it. Okay. So I want to just show you, we're hoping this is going to work. Yeah. It's a three and a half minute video that shows you uh, the actual project. Yeah, so let's pull that up. I think I've got it. Sorry. Back to here. I have faith in you, Jim. More, yeah, I don't yeah. deserve it, but thanks. Um, State government agencies provide identity credentials in the form of driver's licenses, professional licenses, and other types of documents to their residents and businesses. Residents and businesses need to produce these credentials to do business in and access various services offered by the state. Whether applying for a professional or business license, applying for a driver's license, or when documents need to be requested from different departments, repeating the same process is costly for the state and time consuming for the applicant. However, there is an easier way. Let's consider Emily's scenario. She works in an accounting firm and wants to get her CPA license. For this, she needs to get her educational credentials, CPA exam results, work experience, and identity verified. Emily visits the DMV to get her driver's license, which verifies her identity and residency. She then submits all the documents and ID proofs to the Department of Business Regulation for verification. Her employer also needs to verify these credentials. And every time she interacts with the government, she has to repeat this process. Emily wishes that multiple departments could collaborate to provide services more reliably and simply, and that she could have more visibility over the information being shared with these different departments. This collaboration is possible if government departments and other institutions establish an identity blockchain network to digitize and automate workflows and exchange relevant information in a secure manner while servicing a request. With a blockchain network, residents will initiate a service request with their primary service provider or agency. The primary agency will collaborate with other departments or agencies as needed and request the information only once. If the documents are needed again, the primary agency will be able to inform the requester in advance and provide complete visibility on how these documents will be accessed and by whom. This eliminates duplication of effort on the part of the residents, the state, and businesses, giving residents full control over their credentials and enable sharing of their data transparently without any risk of identity theft. Professional entities like CPA firms and architects and businesses like commercial motor carriers and rental car companies, for example, can acquire, store, and share their credentials on the secure blockchain network, allowing them to operate efficiently and reduce their cost of compliance. The state of Rhode Island, along with its digital transformation partner, Infosys Public Services, has developed a blockchain-powered, citizen-centric ecosystem where digital identities can be created and shared. The ecosystem will enable state departments to provide services in a seamless, transparent, and fully secure manner. With this blockchain network, the state will be able to help residents like Emily obtain their licenses and other state-issued digital credentials through a digital wallet stored on their phone, a process that is generally contactless and paperless. This leading-edge technology can be adopted by many departments within the state of Rhode Island, from the Departments of Business Regulation, Health and Labor, to the Divisions of Motor Vehicles and Taxation, and beyond. So because that worked, I get to skip a couple of slides because I didn't know if that video was going to work or not. Um, but one of the important things that happened for us was to be able to create that hub and spoke approach at the end. So we proved that it could work. And Jim's going to go through some of the technical parts of it because, again, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, but it is our intention to put out an RFP after election season, which is today for us. Um, so hopefully it will be coming out soon. Uh, but it is our intention to create a singular website where both a, a citizen and a business would be able to retrieve an identity, be able to have all of their basic information stored in, in some version of a data lake, and then be able to do transactions on the wheel, whether it's get a fishing license from the environmental department, get a restaurant license from our Department of Health, 
their CPA license or their engineer or their real estate license and build it and grow it. We also want to try to start um, to be able to register a business in one place. Uh, every state in America wants to be able to have a one-stop shop, and so that's ultimately what we're, we're trying to create. And so, if, so if you're a part of um, an organization that would be interested in it, look, in, look for our RFP coming out sometime this fall or um, towards the, close to the end of the year. And in the meantime, I'll have Jim talk about some of the tech pieces behind it. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Um, this was the use case again that Liz just covered in the video did about the uh, CPA license, <clears throat> and we're just showing in a sense the journey that the user had through the Department of Business Regulation to issue and verify uh, an identity uh, credentials rather in uh, DBR after you had your identity issued by DMV or Secretary of State. And then the whole point is once you had your credentials, um, public, any public user that you wanted to share with could, could, uh, could validate your credentials were accurate. So that's the summary there. Um, part two of the journey. If you look at the sequence of what happened, if you looked as an individual, you want to be a CPA. Again, the video showed this, but the DMV will issue you a state ID card if you check that option um, that we added to their uh, registration process. The ID got stored in the user's wallet you saw in the video. Uh, you would then apply for the CPA license. Then uh, Department of Business Regulation would request validation of the applicant's identity, but that would happen automatically because all you had to do is uh, consent to that. So you approve the verification request. So the nice part about this system is you are in control of who gets your credentials and your identity. That isn't automated. You have to decide as the individual you want to share the stuff, which is really nice. So then uh, business regulation can independently verify um, the identi identity card because it, for your request because it came from DMV. So that's automatic given that you approve the request to share it. And then after v uh, verification, the DVR would issue you the CPA license, say you had all the right credentials, here's your license. That license credential goes into your user wallet. And then after that, anybody can search through the portal to check the fact that you're a, license, you're a registered accountant in the state of Rhode Island. So whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, or anything else, having a public registry available to check uh, is important to you. And so the idea, as she said earlier, was that it's not just within Rhode Island, but even outside of Rhode Island. Everybody could start using this form of digital identity and creden credential verification. And really, the, the other side, as an individual or a firm, too, is the idea that there's consent management formally happening all the way through the process. So yes, it's automated, but we give you control where you need to as an individual or an organization. So hopefully, that all makes sense as a flow. You can probably skip that. Yeah, I agree. So that said, um, oh look, we, Liz already summarized this, so I'm not going to repeat this part on the blockchain project. So we'll talk about um, just the basic flow of how it actually happened at the DMV. So what we did is modify the DMV registration process to say, OK, step one. The way this system worked, we got from the DMP, because you check the box that says, yes, give me a digital identity. We got a data file from them automatically in JSON format that came into this process flow. So we created a wallet for you, created an identity as well that we put in the wallet, stored that in the wallet, and then actually took your um, identity and stored it in a state credential registry, then verified access to everything, and then um, ended with, in a sense, an output response that said, OK, look, we just actually made all those registrations happen. And they all actually work. This, I won't go through to explain it, except to say the simple concept is this is the trust over IP model that shows you the concept there's an issuer. In this case, the legal issuer is the state of Rhode Island. The holder was Emily, who uh, wanted a CPA license and an identity. And then the verifier would have been an employer that wanted to hire her, right? And so the fun part is the verifier says, prove you um, are a CPA in the state of Rhode Island. So obviously, she approved the. Uh, request to share her credential, which got approved. The bigger thing is, does that CPA firm trust the state of Rhode Island as an issuer? So there's a trust relationship there. They said, OK, because that credential was signed by the Department of Business Regulation, state of Rhode Island, we're going to trust that she's a real CPA and that they did the due diligence to verify that. So in the whole part of, um, I'll call it, the trust over IP uh, model with uh, self-sovereign identity, 
is that there's also governance, right? So that's the other side of this equation that says, here's a firm relying on the fact she's a CPA. Do they trust, in this case, it's a government service that's legally entitled to issue credentials. So they did, but how do they know automatically? How does that firm know automatically that they're legally entitled? Why? Because there is in this registry on the blockchain, they can identify that that is actually the legal entity that signed it properly, right? They have a public key out there, so they know that. And then if they have any question, they say, yes, if you want to go look it up, the laws say the state of Rhode Island is entitled to make those uh, legal um, contracts. And so then if you look how we did it in Hyperledger, I won't go through that, except to say it obviously, you know, Indy, Aries, and Ursa are this plain stack. What doesn't show on the slide here is that the Infosys team was smart enough to say, ooh, look, there's more here. We'll go steal the virtual organizations network that Stephen and the rest of the team built for British Columbia. Um, so all of that work. Uh, uh, in a sense, Liz and the Infosys team were smart enough to, in a sense, say, hey, we don't want to build it. We're just going to shop for it. And since it's quality work that's already been proven, we're going to use it. So that happened. The trust model in action, I'm not going to go through that again, but you can just see the one thing the diagram shows is the blockchain is where everything got recorded on the bottom side, right? So all of the, in a sense, whatever was recorded and registered as identities and credentials, there was a copy that was out here, and including the uh, public key for the state as an issuer. So any verifier is going to say, yes, I can now verify that the state actually did issue that credential, which was a big deal. So that's how the whole automated verification piece works. And so now we're back to uh, Liz's end. Let me see if I can. Over? Yeah, if I can. there it is. There we go. Jim, what is, what is the volume that you can push through the number of uh, yeah, the thing is we never even came close to hitting a volume limit. In fact, actually, I cheated. Once again, I'm a smart guy. Smart guys don't bother actually doing the work. They cheat. And so the smart thing was say, well, Rhode, Liz said Rhode Island's a small state. So we have a million residents. We had about 750,000 corporate registrations. So the smart guy says, OK, let's call British Columbia. Oh, look, they built this thing. What do they run? And I looked at it, and I think at the time I talked to them, it had like I don't know, 14 million credentials in their uh, enterprise registry. And then they told me that they had shared it, and uh, Ontario had picked up the same thing. And Ontario was bigger, so I called them, and they said they had like 27 million credentials in their registry. So they said, okay, Rhode Island is good for the next 10 years. We're not going to run out of space using the same technology, so it'll work for us. So that was my cheat way of answering a tough question. So, And we're very grateful to all of these um, other Governments, I think Jim and I have talked to all of them across the globe, those who speak English, that's for sure, um, to ask them. And it's funny because we do share a lot of these pains. And I'm talking very often to CIO folks, of which I am not. Um, but I think it's really useful to understand if, if you want to work with those, like what works? How does, that, how does this actually go? So very important for us is leadership from the top. You know, so I had this idea, this crazy idea to use this technology that nobody heard of. Um, I got into the space about 2016, 17, um, more from a space of I regulated crypto as, a, as the, in my department, I oversaw all financial services. So we did a lot to make crypto uh, easier to, to happen in the state of Rhode Island. And Gina Raimondo, who's again now the Commerce Secretary, said to me, Liz, you're the blockchain expert for the state, which was hysterical, right? Because he's like, here I am now, I'm in charge of all things blockchain. So I came up with this idea, and she said, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. If you don't have leadership from the top, it's never going to happen. So whatever your top is, is, is absolutely critical. So even if you have somebody who's super enthusiastic, if you don't have people supporting that person at a higher level, it's never going to work. Um, for me, it was also about getting in everyone in the room, trying to make sure that I had uh, acknowledged everyone who touched the space. Rather than trying to force something upon the Department of Motor Vehicles, I had to really sit with them, explain to them, this is what we're going to do. You're not going to lose any information. You're not going to end up on the front page of the newspaper for something going wrong. You know, we have to really take your time to make everyone feel comfortable with the technology. Um, a big thing was finding problems to solve. You know, that's the, that's the big question. What are you actually trying to solve? And again, as much as I wanted to do certain things, People were really nervous about it. And so we said, OK, let's solve the problem for CPAs. Again, super simple, boring. 
if we failed in any way, it wouldn't be the end of the world. We could go back to paper if we absolutely had to for whatever circumstance. Um, but as we move on now, now we're trying to find problems to solve. And one of the important things for me now is trying to get people on board so that I, I can get this adopted much faster than just me trying to push it in one government. So we've been spending a lot of time saying, OK, who's got problems that we think that this can solve? Great example for us is the unemployment fraud that happened during COVID. Uh, we lost a half a billion dollars to people pretending to be somebody else. If they had, to re if we had an identity solution, we would have been able to see save a half a billion dollars. That sure gets people's attention, right? So that's that's what we try to focus on is the actual problems you can solve. There's some really cool things you can do, but it's it's not going to actually solve a problem in government. It's all about how much money you're spending and how much uh, time you're saving. And if you're not doing one of those two things, it's probably not going to get very far. Uh, getting external experts and internal supporters. I talked about the internal supporters, but the external experts, you know, having someone like Jim and um, our Infosys team and others who really explained things to us. Um, and you'll see on the next slide how I, um, I think, I feel like I taught a lot to uh, a lot of our external partners because when we received those 60 ideas from 30 different vendors, I can't tell you how confusing all of those proposals were, were for us, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, setting an expectation of, no, 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 we are going to do this, right? Because I think a lot of people thought, oh, this will just go away after a while. It's some technology that nobody's going to care about in a couple years. Uh, if anything, COVID brought it far more to the forefront of what the possibilities are. Um, absolutely doing it and then sharing the success. You know, one thing that we have failed on is we have not promoted it. It's fascinating to me to hear all the folks getting all this great credit, which they certainly deserve because, again, they've helped me as, as leaders. But we have not shared our success. We were way too bogged down in COVID, and now we're really hoping to try to make that because, again, that will get the politicians who are going to be able to fund our project. If they can get some FaceTime on TV or whatever for doing, you know, sharing the success of the project, then I'm going to be able to get some more money. So I have to always be mindful of that, too. And then, you know, IT opportunities with government. So again, when I read those 60 plus proposals from 30 different vendors, I barely understood any of it. You know, I'm a government person. I'm good at what I'm good at, right? And so whether I'm the business person or I'm the social services person or I'm the environmental person, I'm good at what I'm good at. And yes, there's an IT department and there's IT people in all of the state agencies. To throw all of this big heavy language at us that might be good for the IT department, but as the government person, if you're trying to sell me something, I need you to give it to me in English. I, I got You gotta give it to me so that it's really easy to understand, that it's gonna explain how it's gonna solve my problems. Um, I would consider you know, telling me what it actually does, right? Like, it, you know, sometimes these um, proposals that, that come in, it's so big and fluffy, and it's like, that's great, but how's it gonna affect Susie Jones at her desk tomorrow? You know, I need to know what it actually will do. So consider a section two for non-IT folks so that I understand what it is without using all these big fancy words that don't make any sense to me. Um, giving examples, you know, it's a lot about the metrics too. How, am, how are you gonna save me time, right? Because if it used to take me two weeks to process this and now it's only gonna take me um, two days or two hours, I need to understand that. Be careful though, don't come and tell me that you're, I'm gonna be able to fire all my employees because I won't need them anymore. That's not gonna work either in government, right? You know, the unions are not gonna like that. So I need to be able to say, I'm gonna save a ton of time. And we all know what that means, but don't put it in the proposal, right? Like, don't you know, tell me that. Um, <laughs> how much money am I gonna save, right? That's huge, but because how, not only do I need to spend money to get this project to happen, I also need to figure out how I'm gonna pay for it on, on an ongoing basis. So is every user gonna have to pay a X dollar fee? Is that fee gonna increase? Because if, if that's the case, it's gonna be really hard for me to get this adopted on large scale. We need to come up with something so that it is want to be used by my citizens and my businesses, and that's really a tough one to, to make happen. Um, and what else are the benefits? And then I have to say, I actually took some notes, right? So based on everything that I heard today, thinking about some of the questions that I heard, I figured I would at least address some of the questions that I heard, because there were so many comments of, well, why doesn't the government do more? I will tell you the big thing is this, is this concept of we're not allowed to fail. You know, so if I was to take on a blockchain project and promote it to do pretty much anything that anybody talked about today, if we fail and we wasted X millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars, you'll never see that happen again in government, right? So one, the project can't fail. So we have to figure out a way to make it not fail. We need to make sure that um, we can fully explain how those dollars were spent. And at least this sort of first time around with governments, when everybody's just getting familiar with it, you're not gonna be able to charge what you wanna charge, right? Because we need to be able to sell it ourselves. 
prove it, break it, bend it, do everything we have to do to it, and then you can go sell it 49 more times, right, or, or whatever else it is. But it's been interesting for us to, um, for me even, to have to really talk to the legislators and get them to come around to it. I, I was in a session earlier, they were talking about the, you know, who actually does the forms. Oh, we'll just stick the form online. You know, so even in my government, while my department was 100% electronic, and we were the only ones in state government that were 100% electronic, because it's something that I care about, we still had a lot of um, paper forms that you have to physically drive to a place, fill out a, uh, a handwritten paper, and su submit a check with it. And just trying to make that conversion is so much harder than you realize. First of all, there's a lot more forms than you can possibly imagine in any piece of government, right? And to try to simplify that, that needs to be a part of the solution, right? So you need to have a lean expert comes in, come in with a bunch of lawyers who's going to say, let's look at the form and make sure the form's even right. I can't tell you how many times the form's wrong. It asks for things they're not supposed to. It doesn't ask for things they're supposed to. And the form is just wrong and clunky. And it has to touch so many bodies. Can we try to streamline in some way the process for the form. One of the things I like to say, a bad form on paper is still just a bad form on the computer. So making that conversion is super important. And it's much higher, harder than you think it is. It involves lawyers and regulators. It involves the industry groups that you're affecting. It involves the unions. And you have to do it one form at a time. I think I read that the city of Boston converted their paper forms to electronic. And I don't know how many they had, but it took them three years to do that. That's a major process. Uh, one of the things I heard today was why don't um, why don't why don't you like why don't we why don't governments like throw their hands in the air? They got a million other fires they're trying to put out. You know, there's just so many th wrong things, and the, everything's fine the way it is, right? Like that's the way people like in government tend to think is everything's fine the way it is. Why do we have to make change? You don't have to make you know everything's fine, 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 fine. So you've got to really get them on board to understand that it will make their lives easier, that it will save time, it will save money, it will do all of these things. And again, um, understanding that they're just putting out fires all day, every day on all, whatever problems. Same thing about justifying spending of dollars. How do you justify spending millions of dollars on a new IT project when this is happening, or that is happening, or that, right? Because in every place where all of you live, there's always something worse that's going on. So. It is just a matter of really um, talking about investing in dollars and looking at the future. You know, that, that's something that I'm often uh, repeating to the people that I'm asking for for dollars, is to say if we start small and then we build it and we grow it, you don't have to spend $50 million all at once. <clears throat> that's what it might cost at the end of the day. But if I can just get, I don't know, two and a half, five million, ten million, and, and, and do it um, per year, we're just going to slowly keep working on it. That's how I can prove the concept and get people on there. And then I just can't say enough about the metrics. Um, as far as uh, the dollars being saved, um, moving as far as um, people don't, people in government don't move fast like ever. So uh, trying to trying to get them to, you're, you're going to have to come down to their level of having uh, the pace that they need to be able to work at and, and their prioritization, as well as um, always the cost is is super important. So I think that's what we've got here. Yep. Oh, okay. Take it back. Oh, uh. There you go. She's perfect now. So I'm not sure okay. what time we've got. I think we've we got were... four minutes for questions. There you go. I'm with BC Gov, and I really love hearing about all these successes. So I guess my question is have you considered as part of your project uh, contributing back to the open source community in some way? Oh, and, uh, well, so the deal is I'll speak for, I have no authority on anything, so everything I say has no impact on anything. So <laughs> I'll say absolutely yes. And the answer is, as she said, she doesn't even control it yet because she doesn't have funding. So until she gets funding and authorization, nothing even happens on that side. But I think you're right. I think the, the argument that I can make as to why it makes sense, it, I can easily show you back to metrics. If I said, here's Rhode Island, and what, what did we do? As I said, being a cheater, I started at the highest point I could. So I stole everything. I even stole all the performance stuff. There's no end to what I'll steal. I even dropped in on Stephen's you know, Occupy work groups just to say, I need to know more. So I stole everything I could. I'm really good at that. And knowing that I steal a lot, I can say, here's the value of what I brought back. Because I can show you what it would have cost Infosys to build all this without that. 
So the fact that I was smart to steal it all says, hey, he's a smart guy. More importantly, in effect, um, if I gave back, if we built something useful and we donated back some contribution back to add into that pile, I'd say, look what we did. We stole 95% of it and we gave 5% back. That's the cost. So if I got 10 million in value and I contribute $150,000 of benefit back to open source, it's a ridiculous payback, right? And that's the beauty of it. So in my, every company I've worked at has failed to do a good job of working with open source communities like Linux Foundation, Hyperledger, and so on. And forget Hyperledger, but even the bigger ones, Apache, Linux Foundation, all the ones that have been around a while. And you say, my god, the economics are insane. You get so much out of those groups. And no matter what you're producing on the other side, you're paying back a very small uh, value into that. So the, the, it, the reverse of it is to say, well, we, we don't have to do that. What's going to happen is we're not stealing from the groups anymore. You get the, we're building it in-house, which is an insane idea. So I have lived everywhere where we built stuff over and over. In fact, I was famous at IBM because I invented the Reinvent the Wheel Award, which I handed out liberally to everybody at IBM all the time. So. Well, and I'll just add that, um, you know, so we did, so we finished our project June 30th. We received two and a half million dollars in funding. And that's another thing you have to worry about is it's not like I can just say, hey, I need some money to do this project. I've got to come up with a proposal that's due at the end of September that gets vetted, that hopefully goes into the legislature in January, which gets voted on June, and then I get the dollars in July for an idea that I came up with in, April of the following, the year before, right? So it just takes a long time to get those dollars. Now again, we got our, we got our first two and a half million. We now know we're asking for a minimum of five million on an ongoing basis. But if I don't get it for one year, psh, the project dies for a year until I can get somebody interested back in it. That's how, huff, that's how tough it is for us to get the, those projects going. But it would be our intention to keep it open source. Shai? Is, is the intention to take the pilot code that you're about and scale it So that's a good question. I think it depends on how our RFP goes. Um, we haven't decided what we're going to do there. I, I think we want to take the same idea and build it and grow it. But the question is whether we have to start from scratch or not. I think that will depend on procurement. So another good point of we had a company with a contract. That's over. Now I have to re-RFP it out. It might be the same company. It might be a different company. And that will change things. Uh, do you own the IP or the company owns the IP? Because there's no money transacted between you guys. Uh, what, in a sense, there is an application that was built under contract for the state. So the state owns the work product. I'm guaranteed. I haven't read the contracts. Yeah. I know they own the work product. It belongs to the state, period. So that's not an issue. Um, the issue is, I guess maybe your question is getting back to, is there anything from that that would be worth contributing back? I'm not sure there is. I don't know that that's the case. The reality is, if you look at what BCGov and the other guys have already done, I can't say that we, quote, extended the boundary. What we did is reapplied it to a different use case, for sure. And so it would really be her team that would have to not only do the RFP, but do the assessment. Is there anything at this point worth contributing back? So I don't have an answer to that. Okay. The gentleman in blue. It was the same question, are you oh. looking to move it forward? Uh, and I guess IT belongs to BC here for all of us. <laughs> well, that part Thank of it BC for again. sure. <laughs> Some open source. One side. Go ahead. Where is the credential custody for the accountant? So there's. There's an enterprise wallet that has, in a sense, uh, all of the credentials and the identities that's been issued. Um, and you, of course, got everything recorded on a blockchain, but then you have your own individual wallet that has your identity and the credentials you've been issued, you know, for, that, for what it's worth. So does that mean that the individual accountants, as they sign up, they might have like a mobile app on their phone? Yeah, we did it with a mobile app. We did a simple one. The, the default one that they already had from BCGov was using Xamarin, which is not the world's best mobile technology, but it was built and we modified it, so. So does that mobile app custody their, their ultimate credential or is it just ac their access credential to the system? It has the credentials that we've issued. So your identity is in that wallet. Your CPA license is in that wallet for sure, in that mobile wallet. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, absolutely. That's rarely how government works. Um, 
you know, the, the COVID dollars were a little bit different. Uh, that's that's kind of how we're going to get the project started. But no, it would be in every year. Uh, it is it is rare for them to invest long term. Um, there are different mechanisms that might be helpful to me, but on an ongoing basis, I'm only going to be able to know that I can commit to so much per year. I might get lucky. I might not. It depends probably on election cycles, who's in charge, whatever problems du jour are still going on in government. So I know you kind of cited the you have a governance framework that's driving how all the participants are, are uh, operating in this environment? You know, not yet. This was, this was hard enough, right? You know, especially during a, we, this was the only thing I did besides COVID work for two years. And we wanted to do so much more, hence the not promoting our success. Um, but it would be our intention to, to do a much better job next time. Just out of curiosity, are there any other uh, state or local governments doing something these lines or anything that you're aware of? So it's my understanding that nobody else in America is doing anything like this from an identity perspective. Um, however, there are uh, other government entities doing a variety of different blockchain projects, but nothing with an identity base. And, and yeah, so to be honest, I did a lot of research, not just for them, but also after that in the public sector space, looking at all the states and trying to drive into where they were on identity. There were a lot of states doing a form of digital identity, which mostly boiled down to digital driver's licenses, which I, I don't know, it's 15 or 20 states have them. It's nothing like this at all as a technology, zero. So like if you look at the benefits of this that she was going through, not just the efficiencies, but the trust in a sense and all of those models, the privacy controls, none of those other identity projects are touching this. So I was, as I tell everybody, the luckiest guy in the world to stumble into getting to work with Liz and her team on trying to implement something that is really different. So to be fair, yes, we didn't invent it. I personally said, let's steal it all, which they did. But the beauty is it was great stuff and a completely different model for how to manage identity, credentials, privacy, consent, trust, and all of that stuff. And it's automating digital trust at a much higher level. The other governments, she's right, they do blockchain, they do digital identity, and it's nothing like this for sure. And that's why I think this thing has a lot of legs, you know, thanks to all the work that you guys did as well. Um, that in the long term, this is going to be a solution that really wins. It'll take a while. It's going to wind up being paired identity solutions for a long time. But there's no doubt that the technology is a winner. It's not just a winner from a control and a governance perspective in terms of what it can do, but it's a huge winner from a productivity perspective across the board. So if you look at the use case they did, it's ridiculous. They were even able to automate the fact that when I got hired as a CPA into that firm, it automatically would update the state to say, yes, they now comply with the right regulations for the number of CPAs. So they were doing all these cool things that are all manual today. So if she invites me, I'd go to the state legislature and say, you guys are nuts not to invest in this stuff. Well, you know, that brings up another good point, is the legislation piece. Um, if you want to do a digital, a digital driver's license, pretty much every state would require legislative change for that. Right. And that's, to a certain extent, once a year for most states. It doesn't, sometimes it's every other year. It doesn't even happen every year. So until you pass the legislation, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck. So finding projects to keep the project going that are smaller and can, again, build some excitement and have people want to be a part of, you know, the hub and spoke model, it's, it's just a lot harder in government um, to, to get things done. Not my department, but I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, everyone, thank you very much. Um, if, you, if you see stuff that you think I'd be interested in, I'm always a big fan of please send it to me if you think it's really good stuff, because we're always, again, beg borrowing and stealing from everybody else. Um, and I'll be tonight um, at the event if anybody has questions then. Thank you very much.